Welcome once again to another episode of What's a Prof? Well, Martin, we're continuing our little discussion. I'm sure the people were ex uh, anxious to see what's happening next. I hope so. Uh, I am. <laughs> so let's open with a word of prayer and get it right into it. Hi, Heavenly Father, it's a privilege to study your creation. We can just stand in awe at everything that you've given us to acknowledge that you truly exist. Help us to realize this and help us in this discussion and also viewers and listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Martin, last time we spoke about how all of this came into existence. Now, all of this beauty that you see mm. and the ability to see it in the first place, with all the intricacy that's involved with that, was an explosion from nothing. <laughs> well, you mentioning this, just take the eye. There's not even a camera on earth that can replicate an eye. You're right. With focusing and the different colors. I mean, you have to have so many settings just to, if you take your camera from here to there, then you have to adjust everything and go crazy. Your eye does it automatically. And the depths, I mean. Mine are getting old now. I need a little bit of assistance, but uh, it'll go back to the original. That's okay. You started off with good eyes in, when you were a kid. So we're talking about In the Beginning, part two now. And uh, we were last with the Big Bang, and we had discussed what science says about the Big Bang. Mm. So in our last discussion, we discussed how science claims that everything we have in the universe came about by an explosion of nothing. nothing yeah. Now we were discussing 10 questions. Now the ninth one is the evolution of the molecules of life because they all require totally different environmental conditions to come into existence without enzymes and some have never been produced under any simulated environmental conditions. And why do we cling to this explanation for the origins of the chemical of life? The Big Bang produced all the elements, so they say. Now, these elements are basically the periodic table. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Everything that's mm -hmm. in them. And one of them is carbon, of course. Mm -hmm. And life is based on carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. How did you combine those into the molecules that are required for life? Mm. That requires a different kind of evolution. And it has to come about naturalistically, because remember, there's no God. There is no organizer. We haven't even looked at some of the other questions that we had, like uh, irreducible complexity and all of those issues. We'll come to that just now. So how did these chemicals that you need for life come into existence in the first place, right? Because all you had was an explosion of nothing. To produce. To produce everything. But in order to produce everything, everything had to coalesce back on itself, explode again after multiplying itself in nuclear fusions, create the elements for the evolution of molecules so that you eventually can have life. It's a very big issue. Mm -hmm. So moreover, the reactions that have been simulated produce left and right-handed molecules, but life can only use the left-handed racemic molecules and there's no random mechanism that allows for this. Moreover, the early atmosphere would have to have been a reducing atmosphere, devoid of oxygen. But if water is essential for evolution of life, then the absence of an ozone layer without oxygen then you would have had cosmic radiation, would split the water into hydrogen and oxygen radicals, and the atmosphere could never have been a reducing atmosphere. No, that's a mouthful. Yeah, yeah. Shall we unpack it? Please. Okay, let's have a look at this. How do we get organic molecules? You have to get it naturalistically. Now, this was the famous experiment by Stanley Miller, where he postulated a soup mm -hmm. with elements in it and an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But he had a closed system. Can you see it's yeah. totally closed? Mm -hmm. Everything is closed off. And then he had an atmosphere which contained methane, ammonia, 
and hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So there's a nitrogen in there, there's a carbon in there, there's a hydrogen in there, but there's no oxygen. Can you see that? Yes. So that's a reducing atmosphere. Because if you put oxygen in there, nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you create something, it will oxidize and be gone. Yeah. It'll burn up. So you can never get molecules naturalistically if you have an atmosphere that has oxygen in it. But in order to have something happen, you have to have something to dissolve in it in, and that's water. And water has oxygen. And water consists of hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. So now you have a misnomer. So you have this atmosphere, it has no oxygen, but you have water. Now, if there is no oxygen in our atmosphere, mm -hmm. then under the current model, mm -hmm. there would also be no ozone layer because that consists of oxygen. And under the current model, yeah. the ozone layer is what protects this Earth from cosmic radiation. So without the oxygen, there would be massive radiation coming in to our atmosphere. Yeah. You with me? Yes, yes. Now if there's water, then there will be water vapor in the atmosphere. So then there will be And that consists of hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. When the cosmic radiation strikes it, it will split the oxygen off from the hydrogen and then you will have oxygen. Yeah. Then you don't have a reducing atmosphere, then nothing will happen. But you see they're very clever. They've got a closed system here. So when you put sparks through this now, which simulates the radiation, radiation. and mm -hmm. the drama that's taking place, then you get chemical reactions. And then you can open this little tap and you can eventually see, wow, I actually got organic molecules. Mm. So I know how life could have started, <laughs> how the organic molecules could come into existence. But the flaw is, there's no oxygen, but you have water. <laughs> that's the flaw. Yeah. All right. Now, <laughs> but that's not the only flaw. Uh -huh. There's more to this. Let's have a look. So they have to assume that the primitive Earth had a reducing atmosphere because as soon as you put oxygen into the mix, everything that could possibly be produced, would be destroyed the split second it is produced. So we have a pretty good idea what happens a billionth of a billionth <laughs> of a second after something is produced. Uh, Let's just put that in there because that's <laughs> what they said last time. So they postulate that the primitive Earth consisted, or the atmosphere, consisted of hydrogen, ammonia, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen, and water. Okay, but now they've got the problem again. You have a problem because then you would have radiation and that would split this into hydrogen and oxygen radicals and you would have an oxidizing so, yeah. atmosphere. But uh, just for the sake of getting rid of God, let's assume that the water stayed water. <laughs> now, where does this atmosphere come from? Well, you have to postulate that it came from volcanic activity. Oh, so okay. the Earth was a bubbling cauldron of heated magma with lots of gases being produced. And volcanic gases consist of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrochloric acid, nitrogen, and water. and water. I'm afraid now you have an oxidizing atmosphere. So you cannot use that atmosphere. You have to have this one. All right? So that one, the primitive Earth one, can only, according to them, Must come about by the volcanic gases, but that's not possible. That's not going <laughs> to happen. So you have a little bit of a problem here. So you have to automatically postulate that in the past, the gases that were produced are different to what they are now. That's contrary to the uniformitarian principle which says everything in the past must be able to be explained by things in the present. Mm. Okay. Our present atmosphere is totally useless for this because it contains carbon dioxide, oxygen, oxygen. that's uh, dead in the water, nitrogen, 
water and then a number of inert gases. Mm. So this is totally different as well. So there's a problem at that level, right? Okay, so if you do this experiment and you actually combine some of these molecules, then you can get primitive molecules to form, like amino acids, for example. Yeah, okay. All right, now let's have a look at the amino acids. These are two forms of amino acids. Mm -hmm. We call them racemic mixtures. You get L amino acids and you get D amino acids. That's like your left and your right hand, which are mirror images of each other. Yeah. Okay, your right hand doesn't look like your left mm -hmm. hand, otherwise your thumb would be on that side, yes. right? So they're mirror images. So just like you have two hands that are mirror images, these amino acids are mirror images of each other. Can mm -hmm. you see that? Yes, I see. Okay, this one is an L amino acid, which is the left-handed amino acid. Mm -hmm. And this one is a right-handed amino acid. You with me? Exactly. Okay. Understand. Now, life only uses L amino acids. Mm -hmm. But if you have this production of amino acids, then you have a little problem because you produce left and right-handed amino acids. Okay, so you, so you have a mixture now of left and right-handed ones, but mm. somehow, because life only uses the left-handed ones, you must have a mechanism of selecting only the left-handed ones. And for that, you need an enzyme. Mm. But the enzyme consists of them, so how do you get the enzyme to only take the left, to actually be produced with only left-handed ones by chance? Yeah. <laughs> Can you see you have a major problem here? Huge. It's easy to say, okay, I've got a mixture of protein-like substances, but they're useless for life. Exactly. So There's another problem. Yeah. An amino acid has this group over here, this carboxyl group over here, COOH, and the first carbon, that's what makes it an acid, okay? Mm -hmm. The first carbon after this group is called the alpha carbon. Okay. It's the first carbon. And then you have many, many carbons that you can put in a row after that. That will be the beta, the delta, the gamma, the et cetera, et cetera, mm. amino acid. So this amino group over here, which makes it an amino acid, uh -huh. always is attached to the alpha carbon. But there's no reason why it can't be attached to the beta or any of the subsequent carbons. Mm, mm, so what makes it choose okay. the first one? So if you get this random mixture, mm. you will get left-handed amino acids, you will get right-handed amino acids, you'll get alpha, beta, delta, gamma, any of that gamut, but life only uses L-alpha. What mechanism must there be to select them out of this pool? Because if you make a protein and there happens to be one that is not alpha or one that is not L, it's useless. Yeah. It doesn't work. Martin, there is a design feature there and there is no designer because there is yeah. no God. Yeah. How do you get it? No, yeah. So they get this pot of boiling things and there are proteinaceous molecules in there and they're very excited. And mm -hmm. Fox's protein, the scientist Fox, yeah. had these bowls of proteinaceous substances. Totally useless for life, but very exciting because you've got a protein substance. Can you see there's no sulfur in there? No. And in the atmosphere, they also didn't have any sulfur. Mm -hmm. But some amino acids contain sulfur, so you have to somehow add that later because you also need sulfur-containing amino acids. So it's a major problem. You might be able to get the protein-like substance, but, but it's useless. Yes. Without a mechanism to extract it. The mechanism is in the enzyme. And, yeah. and an enzyme consists of amino acids which have come together as a protein. 
It only has L yeah. and alpha, nothing else. So how did it get it? Because it would never get it naturalistically no, by itself. No, because something has to physically choose it. Yes. Yeah. But there is nothing to choose it. Exactly, according to them. And you can't use an enzyme because they don't exist yet. And by the way, if you want to get really complicated, the enzyme's sequence and structure is coded for by the DNA. <laughs> and the DNA consists of these nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and RNA contains uracil as well. Mm. Now you can see that this is a totally different structure, right? Now the atmosphere that you had mm -hmm. to produce the amino acids doesn't produce these. Oh, okay, so now... You need another atmosphere. <laughs> so now you create another atmosphere. How are you going to create another atmosphere if you have a closed system and this Earth is the closed system? You have to somehow postulate that it happened somewhere else, right? So now it didn't happen here on Earth. That's right. So you have to develop another theory and say, well, maybe it couldn't have happened on Earth. <laughs> so they have another theory which is called panspermia. Uh-huh. It came from outer space. Okay. So meteors <laughs> had the circumstances that were required and these molecules were flown in and happened to be put into the mixture that was bubbling down here and that's how we got these things. Martin, are you in the realm of science or are you in the realm of faith? Definitely in the realm of faith. All right, and like because you now you've got no. space <laughs> no, look, <this laughs> involved is and everything definitely it's uh, like you mentioned that other mysticism is almost incorporated here at this all point. right now remember everything has mirror images as mm -hmm, well mm -hmm. you cannot use the mirror images now i'm not even going to go into the sugars mm. because sugars we only use the d sugar you cannot use the others and you also need a totally different circumstance and different molecular environment in order to get them. So how are you going to get all that? It is so complex and without enzymes, nothing works. And some of these have never been produced, no matter what environmental condition you simulate it under. Okay. Mm. So you have to postulate that we just haven't discovered it yet. Mm. So that's why they probably... Is this the reason they... Uh, start at CERN. Well, that's to find out the particles that they exp to find out what the particles consist of and what energy there is and whether there is a quantum leap that you have to take and maybe even a wormhole or it. We're now in the realm of science fiction, yeah. mingled with science, <laughs> and we could blow ourselves all up yeah. in the process, but. Be that as it may, let's stick to the chemicals. Bottom line is, in order for life to evolve, you need all the chemicals. So in the textbooks, they just glibly give you these experiments and say, here they are. But they don't say that they're totally useless. Yeah. Nor do they say, how are they ordered? How do you get from this chaos to this order? Because it's against the law of thermodynamics to go from the chaos to the order. You go mm. from the order to the chaos. So it's not as cut and dried no. as they would have you believe. And then we also pose the question, if life suddenly appeared on this earth in another explosion, mm. and all of the sudden all the animals were there in the Cambrium, the oldest fossil bearing macrofossil layers. Mm. Suddenly all the phyla were there. That's when life exploded. Now this is what science has to teach. This is punctuated yeah. equilibrium at its best. This is an article that appeared in Scientific American and it says, evidence obtained by sequencing the 18S ribosomal RNA molecules that aid in the synthesis of proteins from various species suggests that many of the phyla, remember we said that's the large category of animals, oh, yes, yes, yeah. appeared almost simultaneously. Martin, evolutionary speaking, isn't that ridiculous? That's 100% co contrary to what evolution is teaching you. Now God said he spoke and there they were. What is evolution saying? Exactly the same. Exactly mm. the same. So you have a choice 
between two options, mm. one eliminating God, one incorporating mm. God. I admit, I don't know where God comes from. No, I admit it too. But he says, I am. That's it. They say, they are too, because their God is nothing that yeah. exploded and created everything. So where did the nothing come from that created everything? He just is. Is. So God says he is, there nothing is. Okay. So how fast did evolution take place? Other discoveries continue to highlight the speed and magnitude of the Ca Cambrian explosion. Bowering and Collings recently provided our first rigorous radiometric dates for the event and fast turns out to be much faster than anyone ever thought. In fact, they call it evolving at supersonic speed. So fast that you cannot find any intermediary yeah. fossils because they're all there at the same time. Isn't that the same as creation? It's exactly the same. Why do you want to put millions of years to it then? Okay. And then a little honest admission. Older textbooks proclaim that our phylum, mm -hmm. the Chordata, did not appear until the subsequent Ordovician period and that this later evolution must imply advanced status. But the Burgess Shale, which is Cambrium, contains a chordate. Oops. Yeah, so, no. so the group that we belong to was there from the beginning. Chen <laughs> <laughs> and colleagues' discovery and description of a beautifully preserved and unambiguously identified chordate from the still earlier Cheng Yang fauna now seals the fate of this misguided effort in asserting specialness for our ancestry. Chordates arose in the Cambrian explosion. Period. It was all there from the beginning. Do they put this in textbooks as well? No. No. So let's unpack this, Martin. Here you have what you will find in textbooks. They're called evolutionary trees. Mm. And you have, for example, if you take the reptiles, you have the amphibian. And the amphibian gave rise to the plesiosaurs and gave rise to all of these and then the dinosaurs and all the various ones, triceratops over there and the flying reptiles and, of course, Tyrannosaurus and all of them. Can you see how they evolved? Mm -hmm. And then out of them, we have the modern reptiles. You see that? Okay. Now, Martin, there's the amphibian. And let's take it there and go all the way up over here to the turtle and the tortoise. They split somewhere over there. Is there any fossil that they've put on the line here? No. No. Because this tortoise and this turtle has been a tortoise and a turtle from the beginning. Yeah. So in actual fact, there is no tree. Is there any fossil here that they put there? No. No. So where does this come from? Faith. It comes out of the mind of yeah. the scientist. So he finds these in the rocks. They're all in the same level. And now he puts them together to decide and tell you how they came into existence, right? So this is just like you said, it's out of his mind. This is a chart that somebody drew because he thinks this is the only logic explanation. Correct. So this is called an evolutionary tree. When in actual fact, because they're all there at the same time, it's actually an evolutionary lawn. Yeah. Because you can take this line all the way down to the beginning and that one all the way down to the beginning and that one all the way down to the beginning. In fact, they call this a living fossil because it's never changed except for its size. It went from large to small. So, okay, so it actually devolved. It went from large to small, yeah. yes. It deteriorated. It the Bible says the earth is wearing out like a garment. It's deteriorating and everything on it is deteriorating with it. If you take just the ages of man, mm. they used to be 900 and something years old and today, if you're lucky, you get to 80, right? Yeah. 
So there's a deterioration. And you go from giant people to small people. The entire fossil record does that. That's in harmony with Scripture. Exactly. And if you go to the serpent or any one of these creatures, they all go down as straight lines like grass in a lawn and there is no common ancestor. So this is pure conjecture. You know, I remember the silicant. It was extinct. And I think in, in South Africa, on the shores... Smith there, found it. That's it. And that fish is about supposed to be 320 million or something odd years correct but it hasn't changed anything from no. then no because it was the fish from the beginning the same applies to the sturgeon which has uh, scales on its back and therefore bony scales mm -hmm. and therefore it's primitive but in actual fact the bony scale is more advanced than a normal scale so it's totally topsy-turvy all right let me explain how this comes into mm. being. Now here's an evolutionary tree that I could postulate. Uh, considering that evolution would have to go from small to large, if we want to categorize the dog species, let's start with a chihuahua. Mm. That's a small dog. And then it has to get larger over time, although the fossil record shows the reverse, right? Yeah. So here we have the little chihuahua, and it looks like that. And here on this side, you have the flat-nosed dog species. You know the... Yeah. <laughs> so they must have evolved over here. And the longer-nosed ones, or the ones, let's say, with floppy ears over here, must be on a different line. Because you can see that this one has floppy ears, and that one has the longest floppy ears. So that one is also short and... Mm -hmm and stocky, and then you have the longer-nosed ones, they must have evolved more or less like that. That sounds perfectly logical, but it's absolute nonsense. Yeah. Because they all evolved out of the wolf. So the wolf had all of this genetic capacity within it. Let's take the horse. Here's their evolutionary tree. So they start off with the uh, hyracotherium over there because it looked like a rock hyrax. Okay. And they put them into sequence like this and then you get the modern horse. And they show how the, the legs changed and how they came into uh, existence. Now this is a German slide, but that's fine. So Martin, the interesting thing is that this is again pure conjecture. Because all of these creatures occur at the same time, just like the dogs. So when you take the entire variety over here, and I want to say how it evolved, I would take the smallest one mm. and put it in line. This is natural variation that is built in. Natural exactly. variation. Exactly. I can put it into a secret, but it comes out of the mind. Mind, because, yeah, it, it's not necessarily that. All right. It's now... Human beings, mm -hmm. do they have, for example, face recognition? Yes. All right. So that means that faces must be different. Yes. So would you assume that God is a lover of variety? Oh, definitely. All right. How does science account for the variety that is in the gene pool? Mm -hmm. They have to postulate that all of these wonderful mechanisms that create variety came into existence by, by chance. chance. But they're so intricate, as we will see in a moment, that they smack of design. Yeah. But you cannot postulate the designer. So we have a problem. We have a problem. Let's take the evolution of man. Oh, they are so sure that we all evolved from Australopithecines. Mm. Pithecus means ape. Yeah. So Martin, they have these evolutionary trees, and they give you the evolution of man out of this evolutionary tree and then out of one of them finally they get to the hominids that look like modern man and that's the evolution and here we have it from the primitive to the modern and they postulate this as an evolutionary tree again it's not true mm. it's a lawn all in the same time all of them were there at the same time so all the monkeys that we have and the human beings that we have, with all the variety, were there from the beginning. beginning. So that variety 
for all the apes must have been in the ape species. Mm. The variety for humanity, the various shapes and sizes and forms, must be in the original gene pool of one pair yeah. with the capacity to get, all the, to get the variety. Mm. So how do we get the capacity? How do we get the variety? Remember we spoke about genotype and phenotype mm -hmm. in the last yes. one and we explained what that was? Yeah. So the genotype is all the genes in an organism. Mm. And the phenotype are all the visible traits that are expressed by the genes. Yeah. So I explained that last time, remember? These are, this is your phenotype, this is your genotype. Yes. Now, I won't know what is written in this book until I read it. Yeah, until you open it, yeah. Okay? So natural selection can do nothing with my book. Natural selection cannot improve it. Mm -mm. Natural selection cannot say, I'm going to improve this book without looking inside. Mm. It takes an intelligent somebody to read the book and to see what's in it, right? Mm -hmm. So natural selection doesn't work at this level. So let's try and unpack that a little bit. So the book is your genotype, and the result thereof is the phenotype. So if the book, for example, contains the building plan for building an aeroplane, this mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And that is the phenotype, the actual aeroplane that is produced. There's a, there's a few things that must happen between the book mm -hmm. and the aeroplane, right? Quite a few things. Quite a few things. Number one, somebody must write the book. Yes, okay, yeah. But there's no God. No. So it must be chance. So God never wrote the book. Mm. Chance wrote the book. Yeah. That's a assumption in the evolutionary theory. Okay? Chance wrote the book. Now, if I have the book, I don't have an airplane. I just have a book. You just have the information. And I don't even know if it flies. <laughs> exactly. How must I know when it flies? I must build it. After the you can only use the phenotype to see if it flies. Okay. You're getting this, <laughs> right? Yeah. This no, you find this discussion interesting? Very, because now the genes is also just still stuff that has to be put together. To, to we already <laughs> discussed how it came about. Yeah. How you get the molecules to create the book. And let alone, you're not talking about anybody who wrote the book. You just have the book. Mm. And the book is the blueprint for that. Now, if you want to create the airplane, well, Martin, is it enough to have the book? No. <laughs> you have to have material. You have to have the material that is described in the book. And then? And then you must have an engineer somebody to put it together. Exactly. Now, if I, Martin, as you are now, gave you all the material to put <laughs> something together, or let's say I gave you the metal. Yeah. And I said you have to create the cogs and the wheels and everything to create the engine and the wings, etc. Wouldn't you have to have a factory? Yeah, definitely. Wouldn't you have to have equipment in order to build it? Without that equipment, would the airplane appear? No. So where are you going to get the equipment from? You only have a book. <laughs> you have to gather it. All right. From so the point is <laughs> that I'm making. It's not enough, Martin, to have the book. Exactly. You have to have all the equipment, plus the engineers, plus the people building it, in between before you can actually have the airplane. Yeah. So yes. I haven't put anything in between here, but everything in between the book and the airplane, where does it come from? Well, according to them, probably then chance. Absolutely right, because it's not subject to natural selection. Until the aeroplane is there yeah. and you can see whether it flies. Are you with me? Yeah. So it's not enough to say, I have created the building blocks over here in order to write the book. I have written the book without a designer, without a writer. I have created the factory and I have eventually a product mm. and now I can see if it flies. But for natural selection to work, selection implies more than one. 
I cannot choose between options if there isn't more than one. That's it. Then. So it doesn't only have to happen once, it has to happen millions of times, and you have to have something that can produce this, the following, so they must be a male-female. So how, mu how much faith do you need? <laughs> All right. So is it true then that selection requires that more than one variant exists? Yeah. So we need all of these different blueprints. We need different books, different genetic codes. That's just handwriting telling you what to do. Mm. We have to have the equipment to actually do it. Mm. And then we have to have a product to test. And there's no God. There's no designer. Yeah, so that's out. And everything that happens until the product actually appears happens by chance. Yeah. Now, let's just unpack that, Martin. Our book. This one is a very special book, this one, because it gives you the plan of salvation. It's actually got uh, who is the chance in there. The, the chance designer. <laughs> He's in here as well, yes. Right there from the beginning. Nobody wants to know that. No. So we'll put the book down. Now, what is written in the blueprint so that you can become you? Mm. That must be... Right, because originally you started off as a little cell. Mm. Half the information from your father, half the information from your mother. That was mixed together miraculously to become one. Then it actually unpacked the information and used a factory that was all in there. Yeah. Somebody put the factory in there because it's no good having the information without the factory because you have to produce the thing. Yeah. So in that cell was the information plus there was a factory. And the factory just did what the instructions told them <laughs> without any designer whatsoever. And your information was in the DNA and your factory was in the rest of the cell. So you had to get the information from the DNA and transcribe it so that you could take it out of the cell to your factory. Mm. And then that transcription was called mRNA, which was a copy of what the information said in the DNA. Oh. But it was actually a mirror copy. Okay. So the mirror copy is the information of what actually has to happen, and the, what is in the DNA is the reverse of what has to happen. So it's, it's quite a <laughs> tricky little thing. Yes. Chance is a very good designer. And then it had to go, and it had to find a factory. Mm. And fortunately, there was a factory. The information as to how the factory came about was actually in there in the first place because without it, there would be no factory. This is really fascinating. And then, uh, once the information was slotted in, the photocopy was put into this thing called the ribosome, and then it was changed, or the information was read and produced a protein, choosing only L, alpha amino acids, ignoring anything else that was in the original soup. Very clever little machine. And I think we should have a, a little look at what this actually looks like in an animated little sequence that is very well done. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus.
The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. Martin, now you've just produced one little sub-component of what you're going to make, right? Yeah. And, and, and all of this is not subject to natural selection. Only the final product, the aeroplane, yeah. is going to be subject. It all came about by chance. How much faith do you need? Well you need a tremendous amount of faith if you want to say this is by chance. This is by chance, absolutely. All right. So, Martin, you have thousands of genes mm. and you create thousands of different kinds of cells. You don't just consist of one kind no. of cell. That's another major problem in itself. How do you know which genes to activate and which not to activate? And sometimes there are alleles, in other words, copies of certain informations, each one with a different variant of the same thing, so that you can get different varieties. Yeah. And if you mingle two sexes together now, you get that variety in there and you produce all of this variety, but it comes about by chance. So you must have mechanisms not only to read that DNA, you must have controlling genes which say which ones must be read. And then you must have uh, activators that bind to certain... It's like switching on a light switch. Yes. But you have to have someone to switch it on. Exactly. And you must have a switch. Yeah. And if you have two lights, then you must have two switches to switch on one and the other one off and the other one on and the other one off. You know what I mean? Exactly. Where do all those things come from? It's like that video now. All this uh, DNA and everything, yeah, that's fine. But then you have a machine. Where did the machine come from? Where did that come from? It has to come about by chance. And then you have transpositions. So a transposon is a piece of DNA that can be cut out precisely, sliced out of a piece of DNA, and sliced in somewhere else. Uh -huh. But it has to be a very precise process because, Martin, if you just skip one of those messages, mm. then your whole message is destroyed because you're one out of sequence. Corrupted. <laughs> everything is corrupted. It's like taking a letter out of a word. Everything moves up and nothing makes sense anymore. So all of these mechanisms are very, very precise. They may not have an built-in error, or else you get gibberish at the end. Mm. How did it come about? By chance. So you can go from a small rat to a giant rat with one activity, one translocating of a gene to another position, where let's say the, the, the gene for growth hormone yeah, is yeah. read more often in that position than in this position, then you will have a larger mouse as a result. Okay, understand. So you can adapt to environmental changes okay. and become larger or smaller cons um, considering the environment. But the mechanism mm. is complex. 
and very precise. But there's no designer. And there's no evolution. And then let's not even talk about epigenetics. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go into too much uh, detail, but epigenetics is a way of even transferring character traits, behaviors yeah, yeah. from one generation to another. You know, in the past we thought the only thing that is transferred from one generation to another is the physical, hardcore mm. information as to what you are. But no, through epigenetics, which we're not going to run into detail, they can look at the other lectures for that. Epigenetics makes it possible for behaviors. Uh, if you're inclined to anger, mm. if you're inclined to whatever. So it's also, that's also on the gene type. Uh, there's genes that's actually activated. Yes. To uh, give that trend. And it's interesting that if you stop a particular behavior that mm. is, let's say, a detrimental behavior, it can take two, three, four generations mm -hmm. to get rid of it. So you can inherit bad character traits from your parents. It doesn't mean you have to In listen to yeah. them. You have to change them. If you are inclined to anger and violence and you inherit this through epigenetics. Now the Bible says to the third and fourth generation you will have to struggle with some of these things. Mm -hmm. And it's so in harmony with, with science. But this complicated mechanism where certain genes are active and some are actually suppressed. So, For example, Martin, if you have a propensity in the family to get breast cancer mm. and you know that the stimulus for breast cancer is eating particular foods like fried foods, etc., etc. If you cut it out and you no longer do that, even though you have the propensity, you can actually put it to rest. Yeah with this kind of activity. And if you do the wrong thing, then it can be activated again. So it's a complicated mechanism, which we're not going to discuss for the purposes. But the interesting fact is that the variety that we have in the world is a built-in variety, mm. very coordinated, very precise. And it's all in the genes and not subject to natural selection. Now, let's have a look at another point to ponder, and that is irreducible complexity. That is when I explained to you mm -hmm. that certain things need to have all the components like a watch. Yeah, otherwise... Otherwise, it's not going to work. Yeah, you yeah. take out one, it doesn't work. So, I cannot get this watch to produce itself incrementally by itself. Mm. I would one day have to just pick up a watch. Biologically speaking, yes. oh, here's a watch. How did it come into existence? It's irreducibly complex. So let's have a look at something that is irreducibly complex. We're not going to go into the details of the science because this is not supposed to be a hardcore yeah, yeah, no science thing. lecture. We're talking about the philosophy, the principle behind it. But just for interest's sake, uh, here is an article in a peer-reviewed journal, Structure and Function of the Bidirectional Bacterial Flagella Motor. Oh, mm -hmm. Now, an organism, a unicellular organism, can have a little tail-like structure, which is the fl flagellum, mm -hmm. which rotates and makes the organism move. And Martin, you produce millions of them. It's mm -hmm. called a sperm cell. Mm -hmm. And it has a little flagella motor and it makes it possible for it to swim and create a fusion with a female germ cell and produce the next offspring. Now, that little motor, just that little motor, it cannot come about incrementally. Everything has to be there, okay. otherwise it doesn't work. So let's just read this, not for the sake of unpacking it, just to give you an idea. Here's the abstract. The bacterial flagellum, is a locomotive organelle that propels the bacterial cell body in liquid environments. The flagellum is a supramolecular complex composed of about 30 different proteins 
and consists of at least three parts, a rotary motor, a universal joint, and a helical filament. The flagellum motor of E. coli and salmonella, etc., powered by an inward-directed electrochemical potential difference of protons across the cytoplasmic membrane. It needs fuel, yeah. just like any motor. The flagellar motor consists of a rotor made of all of these different proteins and a dozen stators consisting of this, that, this, 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 that also act as a molecular switch, enabling the motor to spin in both counterclockwise and clockwise directions. So it's got a forward gear and a backward gear. <laughs> Each stator is anchored to the peptoglycan layer through a C-terminal periplasmic domain of such and such acts as a protein channel to couple the protein flow through the channel with torque generation. Yo, it's going to torque generate. Okay. <laughs> Here is a highly sophisticated motor yeah. that consists of all these components. You take out one, it doesn't work. What's it look like? It looks like this. So here it is, and there are the components. That's what it looks like. These are all the different protein rings that it has. And it can move forward, and it can move backward, and it has torque, and it can go over obstacles. It can go slow. It can go fast. It is a magnificent motor. Wow. But it has to be complete, or it doesn't work. What? How did it come into existence? Chance. <laughs> All right, you want to unpack it a little bit more? Schematic diagram of the bacterial proton-driven and uh, sodium-driven flagella motor. And these are so efficient. They're better than any diesel motor or anything that has ever been designed by humanity. And there they go. This is what they consist of. You take out one little component, it's broken. Yeah. It doesn't work. How did it come into existence? It's irreducibly complex. Let's take a chloroplast. Mm -hmm. This is the powerhouse of our planet in terms of life. Mm -hmm. This is what creates energy out of the atmosphere. Yeah. This is what uses sunlight okay. in order to create molecules so that you can stay alive. Right? It produces energy in the form of carbohydrates and it consists of this structure so it's a photosystem to electron transport chain photosystem that captures light and together with water and oxygen in this magnificent reaction that takes place over here produces starch amino acids fatty acids but it exports sucrose so there it is and it is a magnificent structure. You take out any part of it, it doesn't work. work yeah. And life is dependent upon it. Mutton, it just suddenly appeared one day. <laughs> yeah. It gets better and better. I mean, you start to re really think that these people that um, proclaim to be so clever in putting this all to chance. Uh, really, how But they don't are you? say that. They pack it in scientific jargon, jargon. Mm. so that it looks so feasible, leaving out the problems that are associated That's with it. That's the thing. If you just uh, go back to that picture that you showed about the drawing, and that just comes out of a guy's mind. They don't tell you that. No. They don't tell you there's a they problem. They tell you what it looks like, they're overawed at the complexity and the beauty of it. I mean, you give it oxygen, you give it water, and you give it carbon, and here comes a product that you need for life. It's just amazing. But it's a very intricate machine. Yeah. Now, when you go to the fossil record and you look at insects, for example, mm. they've always been insects. Everything about it and how it came into existence comes out of the mind of the scientist. It's like taking the Chihuahua to the Great Dane and packing it in a sequence and mm. saying that's how it happened. But they were all there at the same time. Yeah. So an insect 
in the fossil record looks like this. Wow. And it will look like this to this day, except that it might be smaller. Mm. Now, here's a very interesting development. Here you have a dragonfly. You get dragonflies with one wings, and you get dragonflies with two wings, right? Now, you get helicopters with one rotor and helicopters with two rotors. Mm. Did you know that the helicopter was designed with the dragonfly in mind? I heard that. Okay, so the engineers looked at the dragonfly. But now you have a problem because the dragonfly has a fixed wing. But beetles, for example, have a wing that folds away and is hidden under a carapace to protect it, mm. like a hard cover. It's like taking it to a garage, yeah. but you have to fold it up. How do you get from a fixed wing, which looks like more primitive, so say the dragonfly is more primitive than the beetle, because mm. the beetle can fold its wings and put it into a carapace. There's no intermediary. Mm. You just have the two, and now you have to postulate how the one came out of the other, and you assume that this one must have been first, because this one over here where you actually fold it away is more complex. You think it's more complex, actually. You actually think it's more complex. Mm. But they use this one to design their helicopters. <laughs> so imagine what one. will happen if we use beetle wings to produce something. Okay. so According to them. There's no evidence that they ever evolved. Or if you take the eye, it consists, this is now a compound eye of an insect, right? It has a very complex structure of mirrors. Mm, mm. And those mirrors are omatidia. They are all packed in and they make a composite picture. And out of that composite picture, the brain has to make one picture. It is so complicated and it's irreducibly complex yeah. because you take away a component, okay. it doesn't work. Besides that, you need an interpretative computer to take the actual electronic image and change it into a virtual image, yeah. right? Yeah. Where the computer come from? Chance. Who designed all of this stuff? Now here is an, an insect in amber. This is a fossil. So The first time an eye appears in the fossil record, it is fully formed like a modern one because you cannot reduce it to something less. Yes, because then it wouldn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Irreducible complexity. And they've always been there from the same time. Ants in amber. No wonder they can make a joke. I can't believe it, Fred. 60 million years since I've seen you last and you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> because there is no fossil to show how this one even evolved because it's the same as the one it that lives today. 100% the same. Except for size. So we spoke about variation and we said that modification in the genes, in your genotype, to bring about changes in the phenotype mm. occur by chance through mutation. This all happens by chance. Mm. Natural selection has nothing to do with it. Only once it's produced can selection say, this one doesn't work, that one, yeah. let's choose that one, right? And genetic recombination is produced by Fertilization, meiosis, has independent assortment and crossing over. That's to produce variety. Now, this is the process. The one is a male, the other one is a female. Mm. In order to get the variety, where do they come from? No, chance. Because the variety is produced by the combining of the male and the female. But the all that it entails to be a male and all that it entails mm -hmm. to be a female must be there before you can get the variety. Chicken and the egg. All right, so now here are your chromosomes and one of them is from your father and one of them is from your mother. Right? Now they're going to divide and split into components and then they're going to exchange information. And that looks then like that. Uh -huh. okay. So the red is from your father, and the blue, let's say, is from your mother, and they're going to exchange information. So then in the end of the process, you have a little bit of blue, you have a little bit of red, you have a little bit of blue, and you have a little bit of red, 
And this process is called crossing over. It is incredibly complex. One little mistake yeah. and you're a cabbage. Martin, this does nothing other than increase the variety in the offspring. Mm. But natural selection can only determine whether that variety is useful once it's there. So this whole process is chance. came about by chance. Yeah. It is so complicated because it has to be at the precise locus. So you have to have an enzyme that cuts your father's DNA at the right place and cuts your mother's DNA at the right place, then splices them together so that the same information is there just in a different variety of form. Yeah, and exactly the same place because if it's in the wrong one little bit, a billionth of a billionth of a second off. You've had it. Nothing happens. So Martin, this complex mechanism that produces more variety in the offspring is a complicated system that is so mind-boggling that if you go into all the detail mm. as to how it happens and what enzymes are involved, and how the replicating enzymes have to work, and how you have editing enzymes running afterwards to make sure there's no mistake, because I don't want you to be a cabbage. Whoever designed it doesn't want you to be a cabbage. Sure. But there's no designer. There's no designer. So this is how it works. Can you see? Yeah. So you cross them over, and then eventually you have a little bit of one and a little bit of the other, but you have this thousands of times. Mm. It's an amazing process. Okay, so let us just recap then. Do you need a lot of faith to assume that the mechanisms that produce the variation, the male and the female aspect, the whole system to create the variation by crossing over the genes, creating all of those possibilities in an absolutely controlled, precise manner came about by chance. Absolutely crazy faith. All right. But you have to have crazy faith to believe in God as well. That's it. So you have a scale. You have. You have a scale. And you can put it on the scale and you can determine for yourself what you want to believe. What if you add prophecy to the mix? Oh, no. Then you're going to have. What if that designer says to you, <laughs> excuse me, you don't want to believe it's me. You want to believe it's somebody called chance. Mm. Let me tell you what's going to happen in 1,000 years. Yeah. At exactly this time, at exactly this place, exactly out of this lineage, this person is going to be born and he's going to do this, 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 this and the other. And as far as the kingdoms of the world are concerned, let me explain to you that when this kingdom that now rules is gone, that one's going to take mm -hmm. over. And then in 600 years, that one will take over. And in 300 years, that one will take over. And then that one. And then when that happens, they're going to divide into so many. And that one will be a ruler. And this one will do this and this and this and this and this. And then it happens. <laughs> will he have proved that he has knowledge that is inexplicable? Yes, beyond a doubt. Can you put that on the scale as well? On the which scale now? On the on sc the scale of there is a God. Yes, but you can you put it on the other side? No, because no, because it doesn't <laughs> exist. It's a nightmare. Okay, all right, all right. Let's just wrap this up and talk about a few other things. The Bible says there was a universal flood and a universal destruction, mm. right? Now geologists divide the sequences of the rocks into what they call a geological column, right? And the oldest strata with the macro fossils down there is the Cambrium. And that's where macro evolution or the origin of larger animals actually started to occur. And logically, they should start developing as you go up over here. So you shouldn't find, you should find very primitive ones down here and then the more advanced ones as you go up, mm -hmm. right? 
But as we saw, they all occur over there at the same time. Yes. Boom. <laughs> Cambrian explosion. That's the first problem. The next problem that you have is as you go up over here, you come to the quaternary up there, and that's where they say where we have the mammals and the intelligent beings that we have over here. But before you get there, you have a layer here which is called the Cretaceous. Uh -huh. Now, Cretaceous means chalk. Okay. That's what it looks like. It's a chalk layer. Okay. Mm. Now, can you see that you're going up over here? This is in German over here, mm. and there's the Cretaceous layer. Yeah. Just before you get yeah, to it. man and everything that's living today. There's a chalk layer. And Martin, that chalk layer is universal. Right over the whole earth. Over the whole earth. And what does it consist of? Mm -hmm. It consists of the calcium carbonate bodies of organisms, okay. particularly marine organisms. It's a chalk layer. It's, if you write on the board yeah. with chalk, you're writing with a fossil. <laughs> and it's okay. these over here are foraminifera, which are small little unicellular shells of unicellular uh, creatures. But then you also find this in the chalk layer, all these marine uh, shells and little microorganisms and creatures like this. This is all part of the chalk. And this, this is all the top layer on over the earth. Uh, it's covering everything at the same mm -hmm. time. Here, for example, is a brown coal layer. It's a mass of the largest brown coal field in the world. Now, this is coal that's not buried in the deeper layers. Oh, okay. It's on top. So it doesn't form coal. It just partly forms coal. And mixed with it, this is in Europe, in right up against the Alps, mm. And in that, you have this layer over here, which is a chalk, chalk layer. layer. Okay. Now, that's full of marine deposits. So that's what the chalk would look like. It's full of marine organisms. Yeah, marine, and that means sea. Everything was underwater. Yeah. Okay. Now, here is a geologist. And by the way, this man was an evolutionary geologist. And he's explaining how these brown coal fields came into existence. Mm -hmm. Of course, they postulate that it was a, a forest that grew there. But somehow, right in the middle of Europe, everything was underwater. Because you have the chalk layer. And he's holding a piece of the chalk over there and he's showing it to us. You can compress it and write with it on the blackboard. And if you dig in that New gate forest, this is <laughs> what you dig out. So everything was underwater, no matter where you go in the world. So Martin, right at the top here is a layer that says the whole world was underwater, but there was no flood. <laughs> uh. And what is also interesting, if you go to the rest of the fossil record now that we have, we find graveyards of yes. animals, mammal graveyards, for example. We have them all mixed together like this. Here you have all kinds of creatures like horses and rodents and everything mixed into one. So they definitely didn't go and decide to die at the same time there. Uh, what jumbled them together and yeah. glued them together like this? They were catastrophically laid down. This is flood history. But there was no flood, Martin. And where's the chalk layer come from? And where do fossil graveyards come from? And here... You have whale distribution and abundance in the north Cerro Blanco, and you have hundreds of whales buried instantly. You see, here's a whale. Yeah. And there's another one. And you know what's interesting? They're largely stream orientated, they all died in the same direction. This is catastrophism. Yeah. They were buried at the same time. Is this in harmony with a universal destructive flood? Exactly. But there was none. <sighs> it was a chance. And by the way, today, whales don't fossilize. No. They beach, they break up, and soon they are in a million pieces. Animals eat, they're just gone. Yeah. 
So you can find fragments, but here whole animals were instantly buried. Yeah. And you can find that for dinosaurs. You can find them washed into the direction of stream flow. You can find that for petrified forests washed into the direction of stream flow. You can find that for fishes. You can find that for anything in the entire fossil record. It speaks of catastrophism. That's like you said, even a fish. So it had to be quick. A turbidite, I think you mentioned it. Yes. It had to cook, catch that fish right in mid-swim. And it had to be cut off from oxygen immediately or else it would just disintegrate. Yeah. So let's ask question number 10. If the probability of any of these mechanisms coming into existence by chance, giving their intricacy is so infinitely small as to be non-existent, then does not the theory of evolution qualify as a faith rather than a science? I think we've actually shown that it does. It's a faith. It's definitely a faith. And the Bible says, Choose thee this day whom you shall serve. If you want to serve the gods that your forefathers served on the other side of the river, you're welcome to it. If you want to serve Gaia, mm -hmm. the god of naturalism and nature, you're welcome to it. But if you want to serve the god of the Bible, then choose. Is there enough evidence that God can mean exactly what he says? Yes, especially through prophecy as well, okay. acknowledging it. So if we read, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Is it in harmony with what we saw the fossil record reveal and the intricacy of everything? Definitely. They, the, the scientists have a term for this. This is irreducible complexity. Okay. So when he says in the beginning God created and then he piles evidence upon evidence in this book, that he is involved in, in the life of this world mm, mm. and that he is involved even with the animal kingdom and that it says it is groaning under mm. the circumstances which were produced by sin and that the world is looking forward to a world created new wherein there is no more death, none of these things. Are we looking at the DNA in the world today trying to find solutions to eternal life? Yes. Yeah. The I solution think, lies over here. I think they've been trying that since death came in. Yes, they've been trying to find out why does the DNA deteriorate? You know what's fascinating? Our DNA is deteriorating over time, right? Mm. But the germ cells we produce, even at my age, can produce a viable offspring. What keeps that so active? What is it that God has built into these things? Martin, I've come to the conclusion in my life that given all the facts, archaeological facts, historic facts, prophetic interpretations, plus the story of origins and the flood in the Bible, yeah. make this the most believable book in the universe and the most warred against book you see and actually you can put on top of that scientific facts the scientific things that you've just shown they will have an explanation for ch the chance for it actually that proves that god is the creator god is the creator in my opinion thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and this world is soon coming to an end when this experiment with this thing called sin is over. Mm. And then there will be a new earth and a new heaven in which dwelleth righteousness. And there will be no more death, no more pain, no more dying. And we will be face to face with that creator, that designer, that missing component mm that explains how everything came into existence and how it is transformed into that which we see. Let's pray. Amen. 
Heavenly Father, the world is bent on removing you from every aspect of society. And soon, humanity will realize that this is the path of destruction and they will fall into another trap and follow a line of reasoning which is contrary to the word of God. But you've given us so much evidence that your word is trustworthy. Help us to rely not on the dictates of man, but on the thus says the Lord. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.